Right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alima Batchelor and I'm Head of Policy at the Pharmacist Defence Association. This afternoon I'm going to take you on a, well, brief look at managing risk in general practice. I'll also introduce you to a document that the PDA is about to launch, which is aimed at general practitioners and helping them to take on pharmacists in general practice. And I'll also give you a bit of a, a picture of what we're seeing from the regulator with regards to pharmacist competence, and that's both uh, prescribing and non-prescribing pharmacists in general practice and elsewhere. Um, I suppose the aim of the presentation is to get you to start thinking about the risks which can occur um, as you work in general practice and what you can do to try and mitigate those risks. And we'll start off with a brief look at individual practice and what you can do to try and improve your practice and put safeguards in place when you are doing work. So. One of the approaches that we recommend is something that Niall Downey, who is a former cardiac surgeon and now an airline pilot, um, has brought about. And he's done a lot looking at incidents and how you, how you manage them and how you manage the risk of misadventures. And he noticed the difference between general practice and the airline industry when looking at things that have gone wrong. And basically, he... Um, identified a really simple way of looking at things and so the first thing we'd recommend that you do before you take on any activity is to think about what could possibly go wrong so ask yourself what could go wrong in what I'm about to do and then ask yourself what can be done to minimize the risk of anything going wrong um, and this approach really looks at putting the patient at the centre and is a, a proactive approach to managing risk um, because you're thinking about what can go wrong in advance. This is slightly different to what, in our experience, happens in the NHS, which is that we wait until something goes wrong and then we seem to spend a lot of energy and time deciding who we're going to blame for it. So looking at risks in general practice, can I ask you all, how many of you are already working in general practice? And how many of you are considering going to work in general practice? Are there any people that are looking at it as a way for a new? Okay, I'll go through these next slides fairly briefly then because some of you are already have experienced some of this. But you will know that general practice is pretty complicated. Until you start working there, you probably don't really understand how complex it is. There are all of the internal links between the many, many different groups of both registered and clinical staff and non-clinical staff and who's authorised to do what. Then there are the external links, and this will be with your local hospital, you might have a local mental health facility, you'll have all of the community pharmacy, the district nursing team, and all of these different links are communication opportunities that when they go wrong can increase the risk in your practice. Then there's a the multidisciplinary team working and you may well find this quite different. If you've been in community pharmacy, yes, you'll have a multidisciplinary team, but it may be quite different if it's small and you may have technicians, but you may just have dispensers. When you get into practice, you have a lot of different registered professionals and non-registered professionals and it's learning how to work in a good way and building a new team. I think one of the key things that I find is if you're going to build a new team and you're going to say have a pharmacist in your team but what happened in the practice is that you're missing a couple of GPs, it's not just a case of trying to squash a pharmacist into a GP shaped vacancy, it's a case of having to look at the whole practice and how it works and think about how you feed that pharmacist interaction into the team and probably everybody in the team needs to change what they do slightly to accommodate the pharmacist. And whilst all this is going on, the pharmacist's role is evolving because pharmacists have been in practice for decades now but the work that they do has changed over those decades and pharmacists are taking on more and more what we as an indemnifier would say is risk-laden work, working directly with um, patients, having to be aware of everything that's going on in their um, medical background and take that into account as we decide what we're going to do. So then this brings about the question of 
pharmacist competence and also the systems that they'll be working within. Um, and we'd, we'd say that the significant increase in practice-based pharmacists is still relatively new, having started in about 2016 with the NHS program and the first pilot, um, and that a lot of practices maybe weren't advised or had their, didn't have their expectations set reasonably in the first place. And so we hope that our toolkit will be a useful tool for GPs so that they approach things at least with some form of information and idea behind what they need to think about when they're taking on a pharmacist. So we'd encourage everyone, whatever their background, to take an in-depth look and dispassionate look at their experience um, and competence and think about those questions, what could go wrong and what can I do to mitigate the risk of that going wrong um, before they start doing any new activity. And think about developing error traps. So when you go into work, you've got your mnemonics or you've got your ways of working that you work through methodically until it almost becomes like muscle memory when you're doing certain activities. So looking at building foundations, I'll skip through this one, but it's looking at your practice and I, I strongly believe that if you can be the best prescriber in the world, whether a GP or a pharmacist, but if the systems and processes within your practice are shambolic, shall we say, then something's going to go wrong, however fabulous you are. So things like how robust are the existing systems? What are people doing with hospital letters, with registration of new patients? Um, we tend to keep an eye on coroner's reports, and there have been issues where patients have come to a new practice, the practice hasn't had the notes from the old practice, the patient has very convincingly convinced the new practice to give them opiate pres prescriptions, and then that patient's actually died. So it's what systems are in place? Do you have any rules for new patients? What do you give them? Do you just let them walk in and say, hi, I want some of this, or do you um, have things in place to make sure that they're safe? Every practice will have a repeat prescribing protocol. Is it actually in place and being used though? So are the safeguards in that protocol being implemented in practice? Um, who's doing the issues of prescriptions? Who's doing reauthorizations? I had a question just recently from a pharmacist. They just joined the PCN. Um, they were on the pathway, they were not a prescriber. They were being asked to do medication review and then they were told, oh, while you're doing that, can you reauthorize the repeats, please? So they sent me an email saying, not very comfortable about this, what shall I do? And I said, well, first, look at your repeat prescribing protocol. A lot of them say that the only people authorized to reauthorize are GPs. And in some practices, only the GP that initiated the treatment in the first place. So they went away and had a look. And indeed, it was only supposed to be um, prescribers that reauthorized. So they could then go to their clinical lead and say, I'm not comfortable about this show them their own policy, at which point the, their clinical mentor said, oh yes, you're quite right, and they weren't expected then to reauthorize at this stage in their career. Then there's monitoring of high-risk drugs. I think pharmacists are ideally placed to deal with this, but they have to have the right experience to be able to do it safely. And blood tests are one of the biggest areas where things can go wrong in practice, and that they're either not done or they're done and nobody looks at them, um, or they're done, people look at them, something's out of range, but that final implementation of we therefore need to do something doesn't happen. Again, I think pharmacists are good at doing this, and it's an area where you can lead, but you do need to have the right experience and skills to do this. So, the primary care network um, expectations from NHS England and improvement are that obviously pharmacists will work as part of a multidisciplinary team. They want you to work as experts in medicines and provide leadership and hope you will be doing patient facing work. From the PDA point of view, we see things at both ends of the spectrum. So pharmacists that are really quite experienced um, and could do a lot of work with face-to-face -face patients, but are just being dumped on, well, you can do all the repeat prescribing and never get to see a patient. Um, and then pharmacists who've basically just arrived, fresh from not having worked in general practice at all, and also before they've got their coat off, if they've happened to have an IP qualification before they get there, they get told, oh, you can do the repeats without any thought about, well, is that a safe or reasonable thing to get them to do?
you will be independent prescribers whether you are when you get there or whether you do it after you've done the primary care network and then you'll move on to medication review and if you specialise potentially doing a long term support for people with long term conditions and you can do a lot with audit. But looking at your individual practice, how do you actually reflect and build on your comp competence? Do you record your competence anywhere? With the PDA, we have something called the boundaries of my clinical practice statement. And this is simply a document where you list the areas where you work, that you work in, and then you list the uh, qualifications, the training and workshops, the, um, I suppose, what supervision you've had, any shadowing you've had with other healthcare clinicians, any supervised practice, and this all, all shows what underpins your competence to be able to undertake that activity. So if you do have something like this, how often do you review it and update it? We'd say annually maybe with your line manager, but then if you have a change of job or role, that's an ideal time to review and, and look at it again. And we'd ask, do you discuss this with your um, on your ongoing personal development as part of that and your appraisal process and we'd say you should and it's actually a really useful document to take to that because if you have um, GPs expecting you to do stuff that you feel is outside of your competence if you show them the training that you've got and you say you know well I'm happy to be able to do this for you in, at some point but let's discuss the additional training, the mentorship and the supervision that you're going to give me to enable me to expand my scope of practice. So I'd ask, do you feel supported in your practice? I hope most of you do. If you don't, um, then it's very useful to have something like the PDA or union support and you can come and ask us and we can support you in um, ways to approach your employers to try and improve things. This is just a quick look at what our boundaries of my clinical practice looks like, but you can make any sort of document um, that's similar. So looking at real cases and themes that we see, um, we found that GPHC is focusing a lot now on competence, both for prescribing and non-prescribing pharmacists. Um, and they're finding sometimes an absence of evidence to demonstrate competence in areas where pharmacists are prescribing. Um, they're also finding in some locations, and this I will say is mainly in online pharmacies, that prescribing practices breach GPHC standards in that they feel that they're not putting the patient at the center, that there's no proper communication with other members of the healthcare team, and that basically what's being done is unsafe. Um, they've also, we've also had some cases where pharmacists are performing examinations without really having had appropriate supervised practice to provide them with the skills to be able to do that safely. Another area we're seeing is medicines reconciliation errors, and we almost feel like this is the general practice version of a dispensing error. Um, it's very easy to, to miss things when you're doing meds rec. Um, and I've got an example coming up in a minute. Um, and here is somewhere where you really need to think about how you're going to approach doing it. Um, I should add that obviously if you work beyond your competence and you're an, um, an independent prescriber, you will carry the medical legal responsibility for what happens if something goes wrong and that GPHC may well feel that that is um, a reason to actually put you through the regulatory process. So that's why it's really important to think about your competence and make sure that what you're doing is within that and that you have protocols to cover what you're doing. We see medication review omissions, so people missing that a blood test had been done, um, but that a parameter was out of range, which required acti action. No action was taken, and in one case, a patient met, went from being um, oral medication controlled to needing insulin for their diabetes because everything went awry between two, um, op um, two appointments they had with their hospital clinician. Um, and everybody thought everybody else had acted on the parameter that was out of line. Incomplete record keeping is really difficult. It's not helpful for any other clinicians that are looking after that patient that come to look at their consultation records after you do. And it's not helpful for you if something goes wrong because if you come back to your consultation note, 
and something's gone wrong and it's taken two years for the patient to notice and make a complaint and that happens quite often because the damage might take time to build up. How are you going to know exactly what you did if you've just put something rather vague and we have seen very vague things or ooh, I forgot to record what I said to the patient about safety netting. Well if you haven't put that you've actually done safety netting and it's not in the notes then whoever's looking at it is quite in the right to say well you didn't do it then so always have good notes and we've also noticed a variation in employer support so some employers are fantastic when something goes wrong some employers really aren't and those are the times when you you need to have your own defense um, and I'd say you know be in the union and being me I'd say join the PDA but anyway someone that will look after you rather than just your employer and the patient is very very important so this is a meds rec thing that went wrong um, I'll let you have a read and I'll say while well, this is thing this was a new patient fairly new to general practice they were set to doing doc man they were given about 50 pieces of work to do in a three hour period, which I would say is outrageous anyway. No one had ever actually sat down with them and said, this is how we want you to do med rec. Um, not a senior pharmacist, not a GP, no one. Well, they did the med rec to the best of their understanding and they did their bit of correspondence correctly. Sadly, this patient had had three different letters in less than a week talking about the same hospital admission from three different areas, all of which had different drug lists on them. So they didn't realize this and what they did was right. But as you can see from here, the previous one letter that had been done was not right. And that patient ended up being harmed because the community pharmacist didn't notice it either. They dispensed the medication. The patient took all of the medication for a number of weeks and they got very ill. Looking at this, we'd say you should always consider whether risk, what risk management strategies you can put in place before you do the activity in order to prevent something going wrong rather than trying to deal with the aftermath. Tasks that pharmacists do in practice, particularly pharmacists who are new to general practice, it really is a good idea if you can have written SOPs or agreements about those tasks so that if something does go wrong, you've got a piece of written protocol that you can show to say, well, look, I did act in line with the practice protocol. I was operating as um, a professional rather than a maverick going off on my own, doing my own thing. And remember to look at the whole picture and check all recent entries. Um, it's very easy to narrow things down to the one thing you've been asked to do and then you might miss something in the bigger picture. And a higher level of scrutiny and concern is needed if there are high risk medicines involved. This next one's looking at remote working. Now I know not all of you will be working for um, online pharmacies but we are seeing an, an increasing number of IPs who work in general practice in their day job but get a bit of pin money doing some IP prescribing of private scripts um, on the side. So have a look at this one. Um, asking Niall Downey's question, what could go wrong? My personal view on this is an awful lot could go wrong. Um, unfortunately, this seems to be a pattern for a large number of online pharmacies that you can go on, you can select a drug as if it's Amazon, you can then fill in a form with yes, no answers, it might be a box for a bit of free text. Um, and if you get the questions right, your you know, jobs are good. And sometimes even if you get a question wrong, if you go back in and swap, swap it to the alternative so it's right, jobs still are good and you'll just get ticked off and you'll get that medication. So as you can see, this patient did this with a number of online pharmacies. They accumulated a large amount of drugs. They took them and they died. So I would say remote prescribing in itself is high risk anyway. Remote prescribing where you don't even have um, a video consult or talk to the patient at any point is even riskier. There's guidance on remote prescribing from the RPS, GPHC and other organisations. And if you are participating in this, I'd say as a professional, you need to go away and gen up 
on all of this and make sure that you're happy with what you're being asked to do. The absence of any contact with the patient is risky. The fact that you've got no access to their medical record is risky. And then the fact that you don't even bother to tell the GP what you've prescribed for them is another risk on top of that. And unfortunately, this example isn't the only example. They're getting more and more examples where patients have either been hospitalised or have died because they've got medicines that they really shouldn't have and they were vulnerable. And this final one is about a new and very naive pharmacist. Um, I'll add for those of you working, well, you, a lot of you work in practice, so add to this scenario the fact that the, patient, the pharmacist had no clinical diploma or postgrad, they'd only just got their IP, they had no advanced clinical practice qualification, and they had no general practice experience either. Oh, and they had no job description and they didn't know if there were any um, general practice policies, but they hadn't seen any. So um, I think you'll agree that's a recipe for disaster. And I'd say for this, you really need to not stray beyond your competence. They said they were trying to be helpful. They just wanted to help the patient who'd asked them to examine them. Um, I think nurses are very good in this scenario in saying, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. So staff must be clear who they're referring you to. We've seen wrong referrals of inappropriate patients and use the multidisciplinary team and make sure that you've got protocols that you work to. So looking at the toolkit that the PDA is about to launch, um, we this came about after, I suppose, the advent of pharmacists and seeing how more and more pharmacists were coming into general practice and therefore we saw an increase in the queries and incidents reported to us and they mainly revolved around negligence, professional questions and employment issues. Our response was to look at our indemnity schemes and make some indemnity schemes for um, practice pharmacists to talk about competence and when we first started doing this people used to scoff and say you don't need that we're fine um, but I think history has shown that maybe we do need that so we started doing presentations we presented at CPC on a number of years we do talks on independent prescribing courses as well we do articles and advisory notes for members um, and provide a lot of our advice for members and then we started doing um, a, a guideline um, it was nearly ready in 2019 and then the pandemic hit in January 2020 and I have to say it went on a back burner then. Um, but then looking at it now, as the pandemic progressed, we still had concerns about competency and then there was a growing number of issues around online prescribing and we also saw the GPHC really starting to focus on this. So we felt that we needed to expand that original guide and put some additional work in. Um, and we spoke with the regulators, we went with GPHC, we met with the Care Quality Commission and discussed our mutual concerns about what we were seeing in general practice. And so we had updated and amended the draft and shared it with the colleagues and the regulators. It has an introduction, a graphic guideline for general practice and I'd say <clears throat> that's quite useful for anyone to look at whether you're new in practice or not if only to see the bits that your practice might have missed when you were um, actually in, had your induction and then there's a rag rated assessment tool and this looks at the different grades that or the different stages that a pharmacist goes through in their career and whether the various bits of work that you can do in practice are appropriate at that stage in their career. So this is in the wording and it was kindly um, suggested by the Care Quality Commission and it just points out that we've drawn this up together to try and make it easier for GPs and pharmacists to operate safely and that we've done it with the support from the Care Quality Commission and from our members for which we're very very grateful. And this is about what CQC expects and I'll go on to the next bit. Um, we talk about the GP training pathway. The only point I'll make is GPs train for 10 years before they can prescribe autonomously without supervision. I don't know why pharmacists ever were told that they could do a six month IP course and then end up in a practice where they say, where you go, not appropriate. Um, so yeah, 10 years. <clears throat> 
This is the central um, page and this shows the sort of initial induction and has some really good points about what you should have had when you were brought into practice. This shows the skills, so you can see that we go from an intern pharmacist through to consultant with the various bits of experience that you should have. And then we use this to go on to rag rating different bits of activity. This is clinical examinations. And hopefully you won't be surprised to see that we think doing unsupervised clinical examination as an intern is a no-no. But you'd be surprised what we've seen in some of the queries that we've had. So looking at the key points, we want GPs to be aware of the variation in pharmacists, we want them to plan recruitment um, appropriately and make sure that they actually um, recruit a pharmacist that fits the, uh, the work that they want them to do. So don't be claiming your NHSE funding for a PCN pharmacist, which is a training role, and then expecting them to walk through the door and hand up, take over all of your repeat prescribing. Not appropriate. Make sure that you provide training and mentorship and supervision. Even a pharmacist with IP, if they're not, if they're new to general practice, needs proper supervision and help, and then they will blossom and will become a really valuable part of, the, of your practice. Have SOPs where you need them, and remember that the support and time invested will actually be rewarded as the competence and confidence of your pharmacist grows. And remember that the CQC is going to expect you to know about the competence of anyone that you employ including locums and to be able to prove it so this is just what the cqc have in their guidance for practices about the various things that they expect gps to know about their employees for pharmacists i'd say think about your competence look at the rps framework gphc guidance cqc expectations and make sure you've got some sort of document recording your competence do some groundwork if you're thinking of going to work for a practice have a look at the CQC report, have a look at the CQC evidence table. If that evidence table says, oh, the support in this practice isn't very good and nobody knew where the SOPs were and nobody gets any training, then I'd probably think twice about whether you really want to go and work in that practice. Have a peer network, really, really important. Some of that can often be mediated by your local primary care organisation, medicines management team, um, and make sure you have appraisals. Take best advantage of your med multidisciplinary team working, re record keeping, really important. Look at the bigger picture when you're looking at a patient. Safety, remember those questions, what could go wrong, then mitigate. And I would say this, but join a union and a defence organisation, you may well never need to talk to us about when things go wrong, but sometimes you can be tangentially involved in something, and if you're working for the kind of practices that is that way, they will try and throw you under the bus. So make sure you've got someone that will look after you, um, because the CNS GP, um, the National Indemnity Scheme, will make sure that the patient is looked after you need something to make sure that you're looked after. Okay, and that's it. If there are any questions, let me know. Yeah. Oh. I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Sorry. Thank you very much for your um, your, your presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I appreciate you've got guidelines for um, GP practices employing a independent prescriber or a pharmacist. Have you got guidelines for GP practices? Oh, take... got... I can't hear you. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Have you got, knowing the increased number of trainee pharmacists doing three months, six months uh, placements as part of their foundation year, in GP practice, have you got a similar guidelines for GP practices when, they're, uh, when they've got these trainee pharmacists in their practice? We haven't, however, that's something that we'd be interested in looking at. We do have quite a lot of student members anyway, um, and we meet with them regularly, so I think that's something that we could do as an iteration to, to include, and thank you for raising that point, and I think it's only, I shouldn't say that, but it's only going to get worse as we move towards IETP.
Hi there, yeah. Hi. Um, thank you as well for the talk. So you're talking about practice pharmacists. I work in the PCN, and one of the things we've got is obviously each surgery runs its own way. So when you're talking about SOPs, the challenge we're facing is each surgery wants to run it its own way and do its own thing. Is there a way or some advice or guidance you could give us on running a more generalized SOP? Um, I, I would say for a few years ago, and I think we probably share this with some of the other uh, organisations that deal with pharmacists and general practice, we said that one of the first steps and a sensible step would be that within a PCN, you would look at trying to get rid of the variation between practices because it's also a better use of your time because if you've got to go into practice one and they've got a 28 day um, length of prescription and someone else has got a 56 it it just makes everything a dog's breakfast so our recommendation would be and work with your clinical directors there if we're going to actually get this PCN working effectively let's sort out those things and try and agree and obviously gather up the the documents you've got from various um, practices and I just in a way you know let let them have at it and decide between themselves they need to decide which are the gold standard ones and then go with it as a PCN because otherwise it's a really bad use of your time okay if that's it then thank you very much